Can we make mead with stinging nettles? You know what stinging nettles are, right? You know that, that plant that when you touch it, it like, yeah. It doesn't bother everybody, but a lot of people. And traditionally, it's used in all kinds of herbal medicine, like for teas and stuff like that. We found online a stinging nettle tea. And so this is a dried... Looks like dried up grass. It smells like a tea. Nettle tea. So we made a glass of tea from our dried tea just so we could see what kind of flavor it may give a mead. Using the manufacturer's suggested amounts, which is one to two teaspoons in an eight ounce cup of water. And I added a little honey to it after a little bit. And uh, it has um, a very similar flavor profile, in our opinion, to green tea. So mm -hmm. it has some of those grassy notes that you might get from a green tea. Yep, a little not as strong as a, like a mocha tea. No, I'm no, it's not as earthy or as vegetal as that, but yeah. it's got a little vegetation taste to it. When I say that, I mean like it tastes a little bit woody, not not grassy. It's not bad. It's not not as strong as some green teas. Um, with the addition of honey, it made it even more mild to me. It yeah. just became kind yeah. of an average flavor. It's designed to be, uh, I mean, it's its really meant for its medicinal properties. But in a mead or a beer or a wine, it's supposed to be like an astringent or a tannic property. So we decided to make a tea that, well, let's just say it surprised me. <laughs> Because this was so mild in the recommend, recommendation um, steeping methods, we decided to bump it up a notch. Now, many recipes for Everything. nettle nettle wine and beer and stuff like that called for a pound of fresh nettles in a gallon, right? So I thought, okay, well, if this is considered an herb, when we cook with herbs, if we use dried herbs, you use half as much as if you use fresh. So I thought, okay, we'll use eight ounces, which would have been the, which would have been the entire bag that we got. And I thought that might be a lot. And based on the way that it puffed up in the like when it hit the water, in the tea that we made, I was like, I'm afraid of that. So I thought, let's go with half. So I went with four ounces. It is like grass clipping mud over here. I mean, <laughs> seriously, this is, this is thick. It's dark, and it smells. A little bit like wet grass after it's been cut for a day or two and I'm a little concerned <laughs> but we're gonna go forward and we're gonna make meat out of this so the trick is this has been steeping for probably close to an hour now I saw various things like people were doing extracts of it where they let it sit for three days and all this stuff and I thought hey you know what an hour with hot water can't be all that bad so Let's just go with it. Part of the reason why we let it steep for a full hour is because we wanted to give it time to get back to room temperature. Because mm -hmm. remember, we're going to be adding yeast to this, and yeasts don't like it to be too hot. Nothing over 120 degrees, preferably closer to 100. So what I am going to do, though, is we're going to get this out of that and into here and strain out all of the stuff. Initially, I had thought, oh, I'm going to dry hop with some of this. And after seeing this, I said, no, we're not doing that because there's just absolutely no reason. This is going to have a strong enough flavor. We have used tea in mead in the past, always as a side thing. It was never the main flavorant or main ingredient. So basing it off of this is kind of an interesting thing. It's there to add tannins, but also the flavors. And this will be good for you. So I'm just going to put a funnel in this with a mesh strainer. Some of the so where are you? Some of the solids will get through, and you know what? I don't care. It's okay because they will just be nutrition for the yeast. So is the tea to some extent, but having the solids in there is just a little bit better. So, are we ready? No. Do you <laughs> intend to weigh this? Is that why you have it on the scale? No. Okay, let's put it off the scale. That frightens me. <laughs> no. No courage. I have no sense of adventure. What can I say? It's in a pitcher with a spout. Shouldn't be that hard. Shouldn't be that hard. This is so unexciting. I haven't even spilled any. Wait. 
movies come well, flying Oh, you out just of said you. that. And I was just like, it's going to go right in my face. Okay. Just to give you an idea, look how full this is. That's just the tea. And then there's some in here, too. Here, let me just dump this back in. That is a lot of tea. A lot of stinging nettles. I would imagine that's at least a pound or more of fresh nettles. So we probably have more than the recipes I found called for. So, interesting times await. <laughs> so now we're going to put in the honey. And for that, I'm going to put this back on the scale, but can I use this scale anymore? All right, so I want to put this on the scale. I'm using the 50 pound scale because I think this might go past 17 pounds. So we'll just uh, play it safe. And we're going to use ye old, wow, ye oldy standby, which is sweet squeeze wildflower honey. I'm going with something a little more neutral-ish. I mean, people will argue that wildflower isn't all that neutral. I think it is. And wildflower, wild stinging nettle, you know, just seems like they go together. So we're going to do that. I'm going to go with three pounds of this honey. So now we got our honey in. There's still a little bit of residue in the funnel. I'm just going to pour a little bit of water in there and see if we can rinse some of that out. So, you know, that's our honey. So I'm going to use the thumb saver bung today, which is solid because I got to mix this up. You could probably see it. There's a distinct line yeah. down here of honey. And on top of that is the nettle tea. So I'm just going to stick that in there. And now we shake the bejesus out of it. There will be no bejesus left when I'm done shaking. The tea was still a little bit on the warm side, like 100 degrees or so. So that'll help to dissolve that honey real quick. And we're also introducing oxygen to the must, just as always. Switch sides. Got to work out both sets of arms. People have suggested all kinds of different ways for me to mix things. And you know what? This is the easiest. You pick it up and shake it. It's not that hard. <laughs> and I just basically go until... I don't see any residual honey anywhere and we're good. I don't want too much foam in there because foam is just in the way. Usually it doesn't really help all that much. At this point, I'm going to add our yeast. Do you want to take your reading first or do you want to do the No, because I'm going to top off with a little bit of water at okay. the end. So I want to put the yeast in and then I'll top off with water, giving it a little bit of a mix. Now, you might have seen in some of our older videos we used to have a little mug on the side, a self-stirring cup, and I hydrated the yeast. Well, I've since found out didn't really have to, didn't, didn't really matter. So I have here the ubiquitous partial opened container or set partial open packet of 71 Beast, also known as Lalvin 71B yeast. And that's what we're using today. Why am I using this? Well, because it's my new favorite yeast. It's 15%. This should go to somewhere in that range. I'm guessing 14 or so. So if this goes a little bit dry, we can always just add a little bit more honey to it down the road, get it past that 15% tolerance, and make the nice sweet meat that we all love. So I'm just gonna pour the yeast in. Get it all. No one gets away. And now, a little bit more water. Because what I wanna do is I wanna leave a little bit of of headroom mostly just because I think this could be an energetic fermentation so I'm gonna fill it to about there not not too much more I don't want to be, be too greedy today right there perfect it's exactly what I wanted and I'm just gonna swirl this this is mixed already so we don't need to make more mess and now I'm gonna take a reading and what are we taking a reading for? Well, just to kind of have an idea of where this is at and what it's going to do and what it could possibly be. And how accurate I measured that one gallon of water. I don't expect that the nettles added any sugars to this. I'm going to highly doubt they did, in all honesty. Now, being that I used three pounds of honey and a one gallon must, at 35 points or 0 0.035 specific gravity per pound in a gallon of must, that would come to 1.105 
But because we didn't fill it into the neck, we don't have a full gallon. And that's something that a lot of people haven't been realizing when they're doing this. Ours is going to be 1.112 spigur, which is just a little bit higher, but that's probably because if I filled it all the way to here, that's a full gallon. But down here, it's not a, quite a full gallon, so it would be a little bit more dense than the 1.105, so 1.112 it is. If you just freaked out, don't worry. All this was sanitized. At this point, what do we do? Well, I got a little bit of yeast on the top there, so I'm gonna stick the airlock in, and I'm just gonna shake this up a bit just to get it off of there. As best I can. All right, I got most of it. Those last few, they can suffer. What do we do with this now? Well, this will go someplace cool and dark, probably, you know, anything room temperature. We've had a few people that have said, because it's summer, they're in 95 and 100 degree weather. For those, what I would suggest doing is getting a tub large enough to hold this to about here in water, taking a towel, wetting it, and wrapping it in around the fermenter. Change that towel out once a day or so because it will dry. But if you have the ends of it sitting in the water, it will actually wick some up. That will actually drop the temperature of your must considerably. 10, 15 degrees possibly. So that 95 or 100 degree temperature could drop down to 80 to 85. Don't, don't hold me responsible if it doesn't, but because 100 degrees is a little bit warm for fermentation, it might make some off flavors, things like that. 80 degrees is like the top limit that I like to go. And now this is dependent on yeast, but any yeast, I don't think it's gonna make really good flavors above 80 degrees. The Reverse is also true, don't drop below too much below like 60, or it may, may be very, very slow acting and could stall easily. So be careful. Some yeasts do go past those ranges, but uh, be careful. Now this mead was inspired by our good friends, Paul and Sam Allerton. I am going to link to Sam's video that she did on nettles, their medicinal properties, and how to make teas and various things with them. But this is gonna sit for a few weeks and see what happens. And then we'll be back with a new reading on it. But in the meantime, as always, guys, thanks for watching and have a great day. Bye-bye.